will be very brief uh, this evening. I don't expect to go all the way to 7.30. Um, and I just realized standing up here that you guys seem very far away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, but I don't know if that messes with the, the cameras. Um, so uh, here, here's the, the plan for this evening. Uh, I'm going to be in the same passage that we were in on Sunday. So Romans chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 6. I'm going to go through down through verse 11. And uh, what I would like to do is just um, talk a little bit about the role that the gospel plays in the life of the church. Um, and, uh, and so, like I said, it, it will be brief, um, but before we turn our attention to the text, uh, why don't we pray together? Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, thank you that you tell us in the Bible that you are compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We know this uh, first and foremost because you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, because that's what we needed and because that's what you planned. But Lord, you have been so gracious to us uh, over and over again. We could point to any number of ways that you have uh, been compassionate and gracious towards us. And so we thank you for all of these. Uh, Lord, for those who uh, are hospitalized or or home who can't be with us this evening, we pray uh, that you would be near to them. Uh, Your word tells us that you are near to the brokenhearted uh, and that you uh, heal the the crushed in spirit. And so for all of those, Lord, we pray that uh, you would be near and that you would work in their lives so that they, you would, they would give you the glory. Well, we thank you for the Bible. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in your word. And so, Lord, as, as we turn our attention to it now, I pray that you would uh, reveal yourself to us. I pray that you would show us Christ for our good and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, beginning in Romans 5, uh, in verse 6, hear the word of the Lord. For while we were still weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And this is God's word. Well, on Sunday, we, I announced that we began a short sermon series uh, for, the, for three weeks uh, called, uh, that I just called Gospel, Community, and Mission. Uh, and so this past Sunday, uh, our attention was on these specific verses, and, uh, and the sermon was on the gospel, right? Uh, and so this upcoming week, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, uh, 42 to 47, and we're going to look at the community that the gospel forms, And then the next week, Jacob will be here to preach on the Great Commission. And so we'll be talking about mission, gospel community mission, right? But tonight is a little bit of a bridge between gospel and community. uh, Because we're we're still looking at this passage that so clearly explains what the gospel is. But I want to talk about the role that the gospel plays in the life of the church, which the gospel creates. That's one of the things that we're going to look at coming up on Sunday. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, whenever you read the New Testament, whenever you read Paul's letters, right, we know that Paul is writing these letters to Christians. He's writing these letters to churches. And what he tells them from the get-go is the gospel. That's what he gives them, which ought to be a reminder to us that the gospel is not just what we believe when we become Christians, and then we leave it behind. Right? Paul, over and over and over again, is reminding these churches of the gospel because he wants them to be formed by the gospel, because the gospel is the reason why the church exists. 
So what I want to do for the next few moments is just kind of give you some, some categories for the ways that churches oftentimes use the gospel in the life of the church. Does that make sense? Okay. So I've got five categories of churches, and just to, to put my cards on the table, I didn't come up with these categories. Um, they are most familiar to me because uh, our pastor, Tony Marita at Imago Day has talked about these and written about these, um, and so I'm just telling you what he said. So if you disagree with me, you just got to talk to him. <laughs> the first category that I want to give you is gospel-denying churches which, of course, I would call not churches at all. Oftentimes, uh, as, as culture becomes more and more post-Christian, more and more post-modern, um, churches, in an effort to uh, become more palatable to the culture, uh, in an effort to not be offensive, right, in an age where everybody's offended by something, um, what happens is they begin to read difficult things in the Bible, like we are weak and ungodly, and that Christ dies for us because we are sinners, and that we can't save ourselves, we have to be justified by Jesus' blood, that we can't bring ourselves back to God, we have to be reconciled by the death of the Son of God. You know, as Christians, we believe some things that are kind of offensive to, to most people. And so oftentimes what happens is that churches, in an effort to not be offensive, in an effort to not drive people away, they begin to deny the gospel. They deny the essential truths of the Bible. And I just want to tell you, <laughs> I don't think I have to tell you, that's not what we're after. That's not what we're after at Imago Day. That's not what we're after at Durham Memorial. We do not want to be a church that denies the gospel. The second category that I would give you is uh, there are there there so there there are gospel denying churches. There are also gospel redefining churches. They don't deny the gospel outright, but they begin to to redefine it. They add to it or they subtract from it. And they treat the Bible kind of like the buffet. I'll take a little bit of this, and I'll take a little bit of that, uh, but none of that. I don't want to hear anything about atonement. I don't want to hear anything about sacrifice. Just tell me how to be a good person. Just tell me how to walk by faith and not by sight. Just tell me how to have a better prayer life. Just tell me how to be a better husband or a better wife. But don't give, me, don't give me any of that doctrinal stuff. Don't give me any of that stuff that makes me feel bad about myself. They add to the gospel or they subtract from the gospel. And friends, I just want to tell you that when you add to the gospel or you subtract from the gospel, you know what you lose? <laughs> the gospel. The gospel is what it is. And it's been de delivered to us by the teaching of the apostles, which we have in God's word. And our responsibility is to steward the gospel. It's to steward this word. Not to add to it, not to subtract from it. Simply to say what the Bible says and to live according to it. So we don't want to be a church that redefines the gospel. There are gospel-denying churches. There are gospel-redefining churches. And thirdly, there are gospel-assuming churches. If you go to a gospel-assuming church, if you're part of a worship service of a gospel-assuming church, what you'll find is that they say they believe the gospel, but they rarely preach it plainly and deeply. It's Christianity light. You find this oftentimes in uh, mainline churches, and uh, oftentimes you find it in churches um, that are... Uh, what we might call seeker sensitive, maybe, uh, where they, they, they assume the gospel. That oftentimes, churches assume that everyone knows the gospel, and the reality is it's just not the case. We have to do the work of making the gospel clear and plain, we have to communicate it plainly and deeply. <clears throat> 
We're not after a message that it could be called Christianity light. Oftentimes, I think you, you hear these kind of gospel-assuming messages, and um, what happens at gospel-assuming churches is when you, you hear sermons on the Old Testament. And oftentimes, you go to a gospel-assuming church, not, you know, not that you're going to a gospel-assuming church oftentimes, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, if you do happen upon a gospel-assuming church, what happens is you'll hear a sermon on the Old Testament. And it's a sermon that you could just as well be preached in a synagogue because Christ isn't in it. We don't want to be a gospel-assuming church. We want to be a church that preaches the gospel plainly and preaches it deeply. There are gospel-denying churches. There are gospel-redefining churches. There are gospel-assuming churches. There are also gospel-affirming churches, number four. Churches that believe the gospel doctrinally, but it's really only spoken about in evangelism. The gospel of Jesus Christ in these churches is severed off from the life of the church. And it's not taught as the thing which shapes and empowers the church. You see, if we get the gospel right, it begins to determine the way the church looks. It's what gives shape to the church, and it's what empowers us to live the Christian life. If you go flip over to Titus chapter 2, we've talked about this text a little bit before, um, but if you flip to Titus chapter 2, this is one of my, one of my favorite passages because uh, of the way, that it treats, um, the way that it treats the gospel message. In Titus chapter 2 in verse 11, he says, For the grace of God has appeared. That's good news, right? That, there's, the, there's the gospel that's packed into that. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. But then he says, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. The gospel that saves us is the gospel that trains us. So we don't want to just be a gospel-affirming church we're not just a church that believes the gospel in order to get people into the faith, in order to get people into the church, and then begin to tell them something else. That's actually a detriment to their walk with Christ. It, it decreases their ability to live according to the scriptures. We don't want to just be a gospel-affirming church. So we don't want to be a gospel-denying church. We don't want to be a gospel-redefining church. We don't want to be a gospel-assuming church. We don't want to be a gospel-affirming church. What we want to be, fifthly, is a gospel-centered church. A gospel-centered church. This is a church that preaches the gospel weekly, both to the unbeliever and to the believer. It's a church that makes the gospel plain every time that we gather together. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But it's important to recognize that the gospel is for the unbeliever and the believer. Right? We just read that Titus 2 passage. It's the gospel that saves us. It is for the unbeliever. And it's the gospel that trains us. It's not just for the unbeliever. It's also for us. It's also for Christians. That's why Paul reminds these churches of the gospel in all of his letters. In fact, there's a pattern that, that happens in all of his letters. What we often say is, uh, you know, for those who kind of um, enjoy the kind of academic study of the Bible, we say that the uh, imperatives in the Bible always follow the indicatives of the Bible. You know, an imperative is telling you to do something, right? An indicative is just telling you this is what is. This is the reality, and the imperatives always follow the indicatives. When you read the letters of the New Testament, and, and really when you read the whole Bible, it is always, this is what's true, therefore live this way. You can even go back to the Ten Commandments, right? Did God say, these are, these are the Ten Commandments, do these things and you will be my people? No, that's actually not what he said. He rescued his people out of Egypt, and he said, You will be my people, and I will be your God. That's the reality. 
That's the indicative. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. And he goes into the, the Ten Commandments, right? Those are the imperatives. Always, 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 the, the imperatives follow the indicatives. We need the gospel in order to know how to live the Christian life, but not just to know how to live the Christian life, in order to live the Christian life. Paul encourages husbands in Ephesians 5, how should you love your wives? The way that Christ loves the church. That's the gospel. Christ has loved his church in in that he gave himself up for her in order to sanctify her, in order to present her holy and blameless before the Lord. Now, how do husbands know how to treat their wives? By remembering the gospel. When you remember the gospel, when you preach the gospel to yourself as a husband, when you remind yourself of the gospel, when you rehearse it to yourself, it makes you a better husband. And he does the same thing with wives too, right? In that same, that same chapter in Ephesians 5. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. There's gospel in that. We submit to Christ because of all that he's done for us, because he is the Lord. And in that is a pattern for how marriages ought to work. You want to know how to be a good wife? You need to treasure the gospel. We've talked about these things before, uh, but we can point to other, to other places in the way that Paul encourages the Corinthians to be generous, right? He says, um, for you uh, who were poor became rich, right? Because Christ who was rich became poor for your sake. And now if you're rich in him, then you can be generous with everything that you have because God can meet all of your needs. And he has proven that he can meet all of your needs by dying on the cross for your sins. This is why we talked about on Sunday, our greatest problem has been solved. How does he encourage the church to be generous? He reminds them of the gospel. He says over and over again, welcome others as Christ has welcomed you. Christ has welcomed us. That's the gospel. What does that do in us? It causes us to to welcome others. It causes us to extend to others the grace that we have received. Right? Welcome others as Christ has welcomed you. Forgive others as you have been forgiven. That's the gospel. The gospel tells us how we ought to live. It also enables us to, to live the Christian life. We need to be a gospel-centered church because that's how discipleship happens. We have to commit to the gospel. We have to allow the gospel to dictate the way that the church operates. We have to allow the gospel to dictate the way that the church teaches. We have to allow the gospel to dictate the partnerships that we have as a church. We have to allow the gospel to dictate the way that we fellowship as a church. The gospel has something to say about all of it. We want to be a gospel-centered church. Because the gospel is the message that gives the church its shape and its mission. In other words, the gospel defines who we are and what we do. This is why, I hope that you've noticed, but if you haven't, I'm making the commitment to you that every time I stand in the pulpit and preach a sermon, what you're going to hear is the gospel. Plainly and hopefully deeply, as deeply as I can, and applied to our lives so that we know what to do with it. And we know how it changes us. You can preach the gospel from every passage in the Bible, including the Old Testament. Right? That doesn't just mean that we go looking under every rock to see, you know, how, how does this... Uh, it's, it's not just... Everything is not just an allegory. Um, that's not how we preach Christ from the, from, from the Old Testament. But the purpose of every text points us to Christ. And the, my, my goal tonight is not to, to prove that or to show that, but I just want you to know uh, that as, as I'm preaching, as uh, Jacob or James or anyone else from IDC is preaching, that we hold this conviction that the gospel is the thing that defines who we are and in what we do, and it's the thing that we need most. And so that's what we want to offer every time that we stand in the pulpit. One of the reasons why I love having, um, why I love having someone read the the sermon text before I get up to preach is because it actually communicates something. I think it communicates 
that if the scriptures are not here first, if the gospel is not here first, I have no business being in front of you and telling you anything at all. I have no business telling you my opinions. I have no business telling you what I think. My business is to make the gospel plain and to to apply it to our lives. We want to be a gospel-centered church in that everything that we do and who we understand about what we understand about who we are and in what we do is shaped by and informed by the gospel. Let me give you five reasons to be a gospel-centered church. We, I gave you these five reasons um, on Sunday, and I spoke, I, but, but I phrased them as, let me give you five reasons to rejoice in the gospel. I'm just reframing it now and saying, let me give you five reasons to be a gospel-centered church. Number one, because the gospel changes lives. Paul calls the gospel the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. If you want to see lives changed, if you want to see addicted people free from the bonds and the chains of those addictions, if you want to see people who are ridden with guilt and shame free of those things, if you want to see sad people happy, (laughs) what we need is the gospel. The gospel is what changes our lives. That's the first reason to be a gospel-centered church because it changes lives. And we want to be a church that sees lives changed by the gospel. The gospel also leads us to worship. I don't know, unless our hearts are just so hardened, I don't know how we can sit weekly under the preaching of the gospel and not begin to rejoice in the fact that our sins are forgiven, in the fact that Our shame is covered in the fact that our eternity is secure. And the good news of that is that none of it depends on us. Not a single thing. Christ has accomplished all of it. That's the gospel, and it ought to lead us to worship. Third reason to be a gospel-centered church is because the gospel lifts us from despair. In the same way that it leads us to worship, it lifts us from despair. Jesus has solved our greatest problem by his death on the cross. He buried sin and death in the grave. He drank the wrath of God, the cup of God's wrath, on our behalf. He took the punishment that we deserved. He has solved our greatest problem. And then God vindicated all of that by raising him from the dead. And the Bible tells us that if you put your faith in him, then God gives you his Holy Spirit and that unites you to Christ. And so you are just as alive now as Christ is. That's the good news of the gospel. One theologian says, I am not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. And the promise of the gospel is that we will be resurrected and we will be with Christ for eternity. The gospel lifts us from despair. The gospel unites diverse believers in community. This is a big one that we're going to talk about on Sunday, so I'm not going to go uh, too far now. I'm I'm, I'm holding it back um, so I can do it on Sunday. But the gospel unites diverse believers in community. I have a friend, I don't remember if I've, I don't know if I've shared this story with you before. I have a friend uh, who's back in Georgia um, who's a bit older than me. He was actually my, my uh, he was the youth pastor at the church that I came from in Georgia after I had already graduated. But we became very good friends. Um, and he told me one time that the, the strangest thing that happened, one of the strangest things that happened when he became a Christian is that he ended up with friends all over the world (laughs) of different cultures, of different nationalities, of different ethnicities. Why is that? Because God is not just a tribal deity. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. The gospel unites diverse believers in community. The reality is you and I have more in common with a genuine believer of Christ 
who lives in Pakistan than we do with our neighbor who is not a believer. We will be with that person for eternity in the presence of the Lord. We have more in common with them than we do with folks who like the same restaurants that we do and like the same uh, sports teams that we do and are the same color as us and hold the same political beliefs as us and all of these things. We have more in common with a genuine follower of Christ on the other side of the world than we do with folks who look just like us. How is that? It's because when sin entered the world and it separated us from God, you know what else it did? It separated us from one another. And now there's enmity and there's strife, not just with God, but with one another. And then the gospel comes along and reconciles us to God. And if that sin has been removed, if that wall of separation has been removed between us and God, it's also been removed between us and others. This is the argument that Paul makes so much in the book of Galatians, that Jews and Gentiles have been made one people in the gospel. These groups of people who at, who at one time could not even worship together for the sake of being unclean. God has brought them together in the gospel. The gospel unites diverse believers in community. Fifthly, the gospel fuels our mission. It gives us something to proclaim. And the Bible says that if people are going to come to faith in Christ, they must hear the gospel. And if they're going to hear the gospel, somebody has to tell them. And you know what typically doesn't happen? God sends angels to people to preach the gospel to them. God has entrusted his church with the gospel. It is our responsibility to steward the gospel, and that means not just being, um, not just being a pool where people come and, and gather uh, and just hang around. Uh, we are to be conduits of this gospel message. The gospel comes, and then it goes uh, away from us as, as we proclaim it, right? We're conduits of this thing. It fuels our mission. I spoke a little bit on Sunday about how we ought to talk about the things that we love the most. I love the Braves. I could stand here and talk to you for a long time about the Braves. I watched the game earlier today, and they won 5-4 to four in the 10th inning. Uh, it was very exciting. Ronald Acuna hit his first home run of the season. It was fantastic. But you know what I ought to love more than that? Jesus. <laughs> you know what I ought to love more than that? This gospel that gives me all these promises of God. And if, I, if that's the thing that I love the most, it ought to be the thing that I talk about the most. It fuels our mission. So then, what kind of church do we want to be? If this is what the gospel does for us, if it changes lives, if it leads us to worship, if it lifts us from despair, if it unites diverse believers in community, and if it fuels our mission, then what kind of church do we want to be? Certainly not a church that denies this gospel. Certainly not a church that redefines the gospel. We'll only make it worse. <laughs> Certainly not a church that just assumes the gospel. And not a church that affirms the gospel in evangelism, but then never actually allows it to shape our life. We want to be a gospel-centered church. Sometimes it takes a long time to know exactly what that means and to actually be a gospel-centered church. And you know what? The reality is, when we get there and we can call ourselves a gospel-centered church, you have to maintain it. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's very easy to slip back into being a gospel-affirming church or assuming church or all these other things. All right. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. If you read through the New Testament and, and read about this church in Galatia, read about the church in Philippi, read about the church in Laodicea, all these different churches, do you know how many of them still exist today? <laughs> None of them. Not a one. And for various reasons. But it at least ought to teach us that we have to preserve the gospel. And the way that we preserve the gospel is by preaching it plainly, proclaiming it deeply, treasuring it in our hearts, and living according to it.
That's really what we ought to do. I don't think I've said anything novel up here today. I don't think I've said anything um, that you've probably never heard before. These are kind of the basics. And just like in sports, the best players are the ones who do the basics the best. Let's just be a church that does the basics the best. Let's be a gospel-centered church. And maybe we'll see lives changed by the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Once again, we thank you for the Bible. Thank you for how it instructs us, for how it tells us what to do, but also that it tells us who we are. Lord, I pray that we would treasure this gospel message in our hearts, that we would allow it to dictate the way that we live our lives, not just on Sunday, but on Monday through Saturday as well. As we read our Bibles during the week, as we pray, uh, as we fellowship together, I pray that we would do all of these things with the intention of keeping the gospel front and center in who we are and everything that we do. Be with us as we leave here, as you always are, and we pray that the next time we gather, uh, that we would gather together uh, ready uh, to hear the gospel, ready to receive it with glad and grateful hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.